Thank you. Um, well, I, I've been slightly polarised um, for the purposes of this afternoon, but not too polarised, I have to say. Um, although Audrey and I are actually in, in agreement, um, certainly some of the caveats that were coming out um, from her presentation, and also Audrey's very lucky that she's gone first, because I've got many of the same sorts of uh, data, um, so I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to be repeating some, some of the points um, that Audrey's made. But um, I suppose, really, my interest um, in, in this um, topic um, stems from work that I've done in the past, which has very much had a focus um, on uh, the US and, and Europe. And um, following that, a discussion I had um, with Melanie, um, where um, it, it turned out that she thought that it would be uh, quite a good idea to try and apply this to a developing country context. Although, I have to say, most of my work, as I said, has not been in that context. Um, but uh, in general, from previous work I've done with colleagues um, in Sprue, particularly um, Paul Nightingale um, and Paul Martin, who's um, now in Sheffield, um, what we've been looking at is technological revolutions in general, but specifically um, in biotechnology. And a number of biotechnologies have uh, developed over the years, such as recombinant DNA technology, gene therapy, monoclonal antibodies, and we see patterns um, in uh, the way that these are uh, taken up and developed. They often uh, promise to revolutionise um, healthcare, but while we have seen um, quite profound changes in the way that science um, is undertaken, facilitated by these new enabling technologies, we don't see revolutions in technology. So the emphasis here is that science and technology are different types of social activity. Okay? So science is about um, exploring how uh, the world works, if you, so you can build understanding and, and prediction. Um, but technology, uh, you would really hope to be able to apply and get robust um, results, predictable results each time. So they're, they're different types of activity. <coughs> and technological revolutions traditionally are seen to have um, very uh, slow, um, uh, well, long uh, latency periods. Um, we can think of things such as steam engine, mobile phone, taking decades and decades even um, in the case of the steam engine, pretty much a century, before some of the major applications um, were realised in, in a way which really began to make big um, quantitative differences in terms of productivity change um, in the industries that they were associated with. When we see these technologies emerge, we often see that the low-hanging fruit, the early um, applications, are, are often atypical. Um, which is why they come along first. We see that often uh, these technologies are not so revolutionary in the sense that they don't completely replace what went before. They often build upon that. So it's not a question of um, leapfrogging necessarily, but also having to build up the same sorts of capabilities that were necessary to build up um, before the technology emerged, as well as new ones. Um, and then also uh, we see that these technologies rely on changes in social institutions. To, to be able to, to reap the benefits from them. So um, we need new laws, new regulations, uh, new um, groups of professionals, um, new uh, ways of organising um, whole industries and sectors. So that is why these technologies often take a long time um, to, to really uh, come to fruition. Because the costs are high, because the time periods that it takes to these technologies come out are slow, it may well be that sticking with existing technologies um, can uh, be a worthwhile alternative to adopting those new technologies, certainly in their early decades. So that's the argument um, which we've made in, in, in the past um, on uh, the myth of the biotech revolution, and in this case I'm going to look a little bit more in, in detail about genomics. And of, of course, as we've heard um, many times so far today, um, statements similar to this made by, by the WHO, uh, this is a report um, uh, led by um, Professor Sir David Weatherall, uh, really a uh, magnum opus on, on genomics. And there's a whole range of things which genomics could be applied to, um, controlling, um, helping to address um, disease burden from monogenetic disease, complex disease, um, infectious disease, um, and, and so on, across a, a broad range of conditions and different modalities for, for helping address those diseases. Well, I break those down into different areas. So we have 
um, tools which are uh, uh, often laboratory tools for understanding disease and enabling new animal models, for example, uh, new materials um, for in interrogating uh, samples um, and being able to produce uh, reagents at a much lower cost to enable the scientific research um, to be possible. And those can lead to diagnostics, which may be related to monogenetic disorders, complex uh, conditions, multifactorial conditions, often pathogens, of course, and pharmacogenetics. Therapeutics, and here there really is a very wide range of um, different ways to apply genomics. Genomics can um, either help uh, to generate um, new therapies directly, where, where the, the, the gene sequences some uh, physical part of the, uh, of the of the treatment, like in gene silencing technology or, or uh, gene therapy, but of course also genes um, help us to understand the molecular processes involved in disease, and so we can generate um, new chemical entities, so traditional pharmaceutical uh, drugs, uh, synthetic organic chemistry, um, still being relevant in the genomics age um, against these targets, and of course monoclonal antibodies um, as well uh, can be targeted in, in that similar way. So we have new modalities, which we didn't have before for treating disease, um, but also we have um, new processes for um, making the old modalities um, relevant to new targets and new production processes as well, for, uh, which allow us to use um, some molecules that we knew well before, such as insulin, which can now be produced in um, much more... Um, inexpensive ways once we are able to identify the genes and clone those into expression systems. And then, of course another point, which is a massive area I'm not going to talk about today, is, is agricultural improvement. So that's the promise um, that I'm sure we're all very familiar with. Um, but even in, in this um, WHO report, there, there is uh, this uh, warning that uh, we, we know that undoubtedly the benefits um, have been exaggerated and it will take time for them to come to fruition, and that in the meantime, genomics research shouldn't be pursued in detriment of well-established methods of clinical practice, and clinical and epidemiological research. So, you know, a warning there that there, there are some choices to be made about resource provision. So, with that in mind, it's important to look at what the, what the overall disease trends are. Um, so, this is some data from um, 2005, looking at broad categories of, of disease that, again, we've heard a lot about today, and just to indicate the general trends, we have an increase in non-communicable diseases um, in developing countries, so the rise of um, heart disease and, and cancer, for example. Um, we have a, a fall in communicable diseases and um, diseases associated with uh, nutritional deficiency and, and uh, um, childbearing um, related um, complications, and unfortunately also a rise in, in injuries, which can be related to um, the uh, growth in, in um, the, the uh, road systems and uh, uh, indeed civil unrest as well and so on. So those are kind of the, the, the major trends. And so those are sitting behind um, this distribution here, which shows um, the relationship between uh, gross domestic product and life expectancy at birth. I'm afraid that the, the labels haven't come through here, so I'll just explain what's happening here, because there's a, there's a couple of types of inequality at work here. There's a, a lot of sub-Saharan African countries down here which don't have um, really um, rudimentary healthcare systems um, in many areas. Um, so they're, they're, they're down here. Then um, above in this area here we have northern African countries, um, a, a lot of uh, Eastern European countries and uh, Asian countries, and then um, a cluster here, the European Union uh, are in there and, and many of, of the, the G8 countries. Um, these are tax havens, which just goes to prove that you can't spend your way um, necessarily to a, to a longer lifespan. Um, but the, the message really is clear that there's a kind of a, uh, a big discrepancy here and a smaller discrepancy here. So there's diminishing returns to healthcare spending. Um, and uh, that, 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 uh, that big disparity um, is to do with um, infectious diseases not being controlled and um, infrastructure not really being present. So 
uh, I would include in, in their political um, stability not being present, but basic in infrastructures um, such as, as we were hearing earlier, toilets, um, uh, clean drinking water, uh, clinics and so on. Um, but then uh, there's inequality in the treatment of chronic diseases which um, is present between countries that have um, advanced uh, healthcare technologies and those that have provision um, but of a, of a more basic nature. I don't think um, we can make a strong case for genomics being particularly useful in the first uh, set of inequalities, those countries that have a big problem in delivering um, even very basic healthcare because they're lacking those infrastructures. So I'm going to focus my um, attention on the second group, um, on uh, what genomics can do um, in addressing chronic disease rather than infectious disease, mostly. Um, and these are the list of uh, the, the major diseases, um, or the, the factors, risk factors associated with major diseases, um, which have been identified. Um, and uh, you can see that the, the numbers of deaths here associated with hypertension, tobacco, high cholesterol, leading the causes, um, and um, of course other significant things uh, such as um, alcohol, lack of physical activity, causing problems as well. Uh, so those are some of the, the, the major risk factors, and of course the diseases that those are associated with um, are um, largely ischemic heart disease um, and uh, a wide, wide range of cancers. You can see there um, each uh, folks, each uh, relates to about uh, 12 or 13 percent of the total um, deaths. <coughs> so I thought I'd look at those and look at how advances um, against those diseases um, have, have come through in, in the UK and in, in other um, Western countries. So um, I'm drawing on data from a couple of studies under the title Medical Research Autism Work, which has been undertaken, been undertaken by um, RAND uh, Europe, uh, which is a, a group of health economists in Brunel, um, and the Office for Health Economics in London. And what they show is that in cardiovascular disease in recent decades, advances in terms of uh, reduction of, of uh, uh, gains in qualities from new therapies um, have primarily come in, in order of the numbers of qualities generated from um, use of aspirin, statins, antihypertensives, and smoking cessation. Um, and in cancer, in a slightly more recent period, mostly again in order um, of uh, the qualities generated from smoking cessation, cervical cancer screening, which I should say can be um, uh, can use um, genomic technology, but in the UK we haven't been, so it's not attributed to genomics in this case, um, and uh, breast cancer treatments, a range of breast cancer treatments. So how has the UK managed to extend um, life expectancy? It's, it's through... I've got about two minutes. Okay, sure. Thing. It's, it, it's through those through those methods. Okay, so um, for a range of other fruits of genomics, we have to say we're still waiting, um, even in, uh, in developed countries, as Audrey was suggesting. And particularly, we, we haven't seen genomics, be, the, the industry that spent most money on this, the pharmaceutical firms, they have not seen productivity improvements through using genomics. Um, they're very rarely in new drugs coming to the market over the past well, since 1998, only 12% of drugs actually even have pharmacogenetic information in the label, uh, so it's not being widely used there. Um, and uh, the new therapies that are coming through are very expensive, of course. Diagnos diagnostics, in monogenetic diseases, we do have uh, quite advanced systems of provision in, in the UK and other European countries, but to have those tests, to make those tests um, worthwhile uh, to put in, into use, you need to also have the interventions, the consequence of diagnosing patients is that you're, you're hoping to be able to change their care pathway and those care pathways need to be there. So um, that, that's uh, expensive. This is just an illustration of what's called the thousand dollar pill, a recent um, uh, drug, Solvaldi, which has come about from, um, uh, well, stemmed from um, the identification of um, hepatitis C virus genome and uh, work to develop therapies from that. So where are the wins from genomics? Well, I, you see I've changed the word here to genetics because also we've had genetic testing for more than uh, 50 years in the UK. And 
there are, uh, are certainly big advantages from having screening for chromosomal abnormalities and monogenetic disease testing, aiding reproductive decisions. Um, one of the, the uh, key um, visions of selling uh, the investment in these technologies in the UK in the 1970s was the idea that you would be able to prevent um, many disabilities by um, having selective abortion, which is something which is off the, off the table in many African countries at the moment. Um, but there's also uh, neonatal screening programs which are widespread in the UK, but again, they rely on extensive uh, care regimes being in place. Um, we may see more growth in pharmacogenetic testing, especially in the cancer area, um, but the drugs that they're associated with, largely cancer drugs, are very expensive. Okay, even the genetic testing services that we do have, we have a big problem in delivering these in an equitable way. It's um, the, the decisions um, for introduction of particular tests are often made at a local level because the resource uh, um, implications at the time of launch are often quite small. So, that, so these uh, are driven locally and it's not about uh, efficiency at the national level or anything like that. We don't have nice type processes which are very expensive um, to be able to make those decisions fair. The genetics community is wrestling with that at the moment in Western countries. Um, and of course, uh, we will always need to adapt tests, even within countries. The tests that you may give to your local population for cystic, for cystic fibrosis testing will be different in the north of the UK than in the south. So these, these all have cost implications. So, in conclusion, I would argue that genomics at the moment is not a powerful enough technology to create widespread inequalities. Um, that we could get more bang for the healthcare buck by investing um, in the sorts of things which um, we've already seen been used in UK aspirin, statins, um, and uh, smoking cessation, um, and so on, interventions which don't rely on genomics, haven't relied on genomics. And that with many technologies, over time the costs do fall, and that perhaps it is better to wait, therefore, um, for many developing countries to uh, invest in those technologies. I'll finish there. Right, Michael, thank you. So, any quick clarification questions? Yeah. yeah. The gap between science and technology, I don't believe that is correct. Because the only reason that the previous talk can speak about the project they have is because of the advances in nanotechnology and the Hadron Collider have created new sequences which we can do this faster. And that happened in very short period of time. Okay, and the other example is microprocessors. I don't believe that. The second thing I don't hear is that you mentioned about non-communicable diseases, but we don't know whether that is because they were underreported or now they are beginning to be reported. And there's all this acronym, we don't know, it's a tautology there. And finally, it is about the infant mortality is not, it's not coming down, it's a peak, it's a surge at the moment. So I don't understand why that data you're saying is coming down. It's actually, it's, unfortunately, so Saharan Africa is going, neonatal mortality is like a huge peak. So that's my... Okay. Well, I'll, I'll take those sort of in, in reverse order. Um, Obviously, I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, and I can only take the, the data which I, I, I presume is widely um, uh, agreed. Um, but uh, certainly, there are differences between regions, obviously, and I, I think that certainly uh, we probably agree that infant mortality um, in, in Europe and countries which widely regarded infectious disease as being beaten uh, 50 years ago, um, that certainly the childhood killers um, have lower figures, and as, as you as you head uh, south, that, that, that becomes, uh, those diseases become more, more of a problem. Um, the non-communicable diseases data, I think there, there is, with particular conditions, you can see where non-communicable disease becomes more of an issue as um, the childhood um, infectious diseases are addressed. So, for example, sickle cell disease is growing in its, it's, it's, it's a, a growing cause of mortality in Sri Lanka at the moment because as the infectious diseases are dealt with, those children live longer and um, underlying 
uh, genetic disease then presents itself as being um, more of a, a problem and of course that's, that can be the, the, the fatal disease. But you can still have, so you still have the problem of, of not being reported. That's correct. Of course. Yeah, sure. You no, have that problem. No, there's always a problem. With any any, any, in any statistics. In, no, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, in this yeah. one testing is specific. Non-communicable and in the low-income countries. There's always that issue. Sure, sure. Okay. I mean, in, in my other work, I've, I've, yeah. I've criticised a lot that the, the use of, of, uh, of uh, funding data um, in different countries over where you have um, data that spans long time periods and uh, cross, make cross country comparisons. It's very difficult to get um, those sorts of data. All sorts of definitions are changing all the time, and collection methodology is changing, things are being missed out or included, often for political purposes. So uh, I, I'm sympathetic to that. On, on the difference between science and technology, though, I would argue very strongly that these, these are quite different social processes with different social goals. I mean, I'll give you an example. When, when I was in a laboratory, um, doing uh, some observation work for my PhD. Um, uh, uh, the, the clinical scientist I was um, watching one afternoon was complaining about how the research scientists had it easy because they only needed to do something once, get the result once for their uh, science paper or their nature paper. But they had to do that, that work um, day in, day out and always get the same results. And that's really you know, the, the, the difference uh, between science and technology. One is, one is about... Um, beginning with um, a, a, a set of um, known starting conditions and working towards, uh, through, through a process, through an experiment, to see what happens. Right? With technology, you're doing the opposite. Right? You're, you're starting with unknown conditions and you're working towards um, an outcome that is desired. Okay, so, you, so if we look at you know, trying to find a, a cure for Alzheimer's disease, we don't know what the starting conditions are, right? But we know what the what the solution would look like. But we then have to go through a very difficult process to, to work out how um, we develop drugs that will reliably be have that effect when they're taken. Okay? And and uh, the, the 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 way that those processes are organised, the way that we deliver drugs, the way that they have to be regulated on are different uh, to to the exploration processes we see in science. Great. And